All right, well, are you ready to get into the message today? Yeah. Come on, I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to encourage you. Typically, this is a little different for me. Typically, I like to build up, you know, to like get to my title and my series title. We're going to be in a series for the next couple of weeks. And honestly, I don't know how long. This is going to be like a series-ish. I don't know. It might go one week. It might go two weeks. It might go three weeks. It might go four weeks. We'll see um, how, how, how I feel it's resonating. But I don't think I need to build up a lot for it because I think the series title is going to make us lean in because I, I think you would agree with it. So the title for the next collection of talks that we're going to be speaking about is I've Got Questions. I got questions, guys. I've got questions. One of the undeniable, identifiable traits of a child is their proclivity or penchant to ask questions. Uh, raise your hand if you have kids. You know what I'm talking about. Raise your hands if you ever met a kid. Do you know what I'm talking about? Try to include everybody, journey youth included. If you have a Medicaid, you know questions on questions on questions. And sometimes it's cool because sometimes their questions are funny. Like this tweet of a, of a mom or an aunt and her niece's questions. My niece asked me one day why I always wear the same tattoos. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care what you say. That's funny. Why you always wear I never thought about it. But to them, it's like change them out every once in a while. Um, some questions can be not necessarily funny, but thought-provoking. Like this next question got me thinking. <clears throat> so my four-year-old, my four-year-old said, why do we have to wear shoes? Me, because they protect your feet. My four-year-old, no, they trap your feet. They're feet traps. <laughs> I will never see shoes the same way again. Let me breathe, you know, like. <laughs> shoes are required, okay, just in, I'm just fine. I know Florida, you got the open toe stuff going on. Um, sometimes, sometimes the questions kids ask are annoying. Come on, somebody. Like the very old, old, age old question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No. In fact, we're still in the driveway. So <laughs> chill out. Simmer down. Sometimes the questions are serious. I'll never forget the first time Justice asked me while we were at a red light, Daddy, why is that man holding a sign? I said, because he's homeless. And he said, what do you mean? And I had to explain to him the pandemic of homelessness in our society and how that has been since almost the beginning of time. And sometimes if you've got kids, their questions can be scary. Like I remember one time after prayer with Zane, we uh, did our prayer, we read the Bible, we went to bed. And right before I tucked him in, he said, daddy, I said, yeah. He said, why doesn't God answer prayers today like he does in the Bible? I was like, fix your face. I had to tell myself. So why don't, he said, why don't God do miracles? That's what he said. Like God in the Bible. And I was like, JJ, fix your face, fix your face. Don't. I had to be careful how I would respond in that moment. Because I couldn't panic. I couldn't be like, oh, well, well uh, uh, go to bed. We'll talk about it tomorrow. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't panic because I need him to know that it's okay to have questions. Because daddy has them too. <laughs> I also could not have gotten mad, which would have been really easy for me to be mad at him. What do you mean, why doesn't God do miracles? You're the son of a pastor. You better get right. <laughs> what is Journey Kids teaching you or not teaching you that you don't believe in miracles? You better, we're going to cast that devil out right now. Honey, get the oil. <laughs> you know, I, I can't show him, I can't be mad either. Why? Because I want him to keep bringing me his questions. Because unlike his friends, my answers won't be based on what they think he wants to hear. Unlike TikTok, my answers won't be based on his algorithm. Unlike Fox and CNN, my answers won't be based on his political preferences. I'm going to be able to try and give him answers the best as I can that are based on God's word. And I wish more people knew this about God. Because when we look at the world, we've got questions. When we look at sickness and evil and war, we've got questions. When we look at our life and we look at our relationships, I got questions. When I look at my bank account, come on somebody, I got questions. <laughs> Where did that money go? I got paid and it was here for like a day and now it's gone, I got, I got questions. When we look at our faith, we have questions. And I think there's a part of us that feels like we are betraying God if we bring him our questions. 
that somehow we are letting him down because we wonder about things that are happening in the world, in our family, in our lives, in our health. And I just want you to know this. If you hear nothing else from me today, please hear this. God is not afraid of your questions. He is not afraid of your questions. In fact, I'll go one step further. He's prepared for them. I might go a step further and say he desires them. When you look at the book of Psalms in your Bible, this is a very important book. I would encourage every person who wants to get into their Bible to read one Psalm a day. Here's why I would encourage that. Because the Psalms have a very intentional purpose in your Bible is to teach you how to pray. Every Psalm is a prayer. So we learn to pray by reading the Psalms. So you got to be careful. Don't learn to pray just for the people around you. You know, because sometimes the people around you, they, they pray crazy things. If you want to learn how to pray, read the Psalm. And the psalm is actually full of different types of prayers. Whenever you hear a praise, glory to God in the highest, hallelujah, we worship you. It's really the Bible teaching you that in prayer, this is how you praise God. So Going to make it about him and who he is. Sometimes in the Bible you see, in the book of Psalms, you see prayers of intercession. Lord, help this person in my family. Help that person. Why? Because the Bible is teaching you that a part of prayer is intercession. Sometimes in the Bible, you'll hear Psalms. They're like, Lord, punch out the teeth of the wicked. <laughs> and you just need to know that when it says wicked, it's referring to the demons and the devil that looks at, like, don't apply that to your coworker. Don't go in your job and be like, Psalms 33, <laughs> break the teeth of the wicked, oh Lord. Yes, God. And I'm going to just, don't do that. <laughs> Why? Why? Because the Bible is trying to teach you that a big part of prayer is spiritual warfare. So sometimes you fight with prayer. It's, 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 it's teaching you. And there are other Psalms in the Bible that are the Psalms of questions. I'll show you some of them. And this is a prayer now. Look at Psalms chapter 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Have you ever asked that question to the Lord? You feel his presence in here and then you go home when things get hard and you try and pray, but God feels about a million miles away. Why are you hiding yourself, God? Don't you want me to be close to you? Why can't I feel you? Oof, I've prayed that before. Psalm 6.3, my soul is in deep anguish. Here's a great question that we've asked God multiple times. How long, Lord? How long? I know pastor said that my season of singleness is to prepare me. But how long, Lord? <laughs> how long? I know I'm supposed to wait to buy a house for when the interest rates drop and, 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 it's, a, and it's a buyer's market and not a seller's market, but I got a two-bedroom and six kids. How long, Lord? How long? How long? This next one I really like is Psalm 73, and it was written by the worship director of the tabernacle. So now we're talking about the worship leader. His name was Asaph. Asaph, the worship leader. Look at Asaph. Look how he prays. What does God know? You better chill out, Asaph. <laughs> Don't come for the Lord like that. <laughs> Did you ever feel like this? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people. They don't even go to church. They don't even know a Bible verse. Yet, their life looks so easy and their riches are multiplying. But me... I can't believe that you're blessing them like that. Meanwhile, me, ooh, look at verse 13. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? I come to church, I read my Bible, I tithe, I'm in a small group, I did freedom, and, and this is how you're going to treat me? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason, waited until marriage to be intimate with the person only to have that very same person leave me three years after for someone else? Excuse me, did I do this for nothing? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. These, I didn't make up these Bible verses. They are in your Bible. Psalms 22, probably one of the most famous questions. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. Because that was the same prayer that Jesus prayed as he hung naked on a cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which, by the way, is a revelation in and of itself. Because Jesus, as he's saying that, we think he's complaining, but he's actually teaching you and me how to endure trial, trauma, and suffering. Because he's not complaining, he's quoting Bible. 
as he's going through the trial. And have you ever gone through a trial where you don't even have the words? God goes, here they are. He just quotes Bible to be encouraged in his darkest moments. That was a Bible verse, y'all. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which also, by the way, is all of the permission you need to come to the Lord with your questions. Because if it was okay for Jesus to do, then it's okay for me to do. God wants your questions for two reasons. Number one, because God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. I remember the first time I ever went to therapy. It was in 2020. Seemed like a good time. Church got shut down. We were meeting in a public high school. Weren't allowed to meet anymore. Didn't know when we would ever meet again. Didn't know if this thing I had devoted my life to would make it. I was in the middle of a sermon and I had an anxiety attack while I was preaching one time. Forgot the words of my, my message. I had no idea where I was going. I got all nervous. Had the worship team come out 30 minutes early. It was <laughs> five, five minutes into the sermon. I was like, worship, come out here real quick. Um, and I just freaked. And uh, it was everything piling on. So I had a pastor friend of mine said, I think you should see somebody. So I said, yeah, I'll give it a try. He said, let me tell you the best thing about a therapist is. I said, why? He said, the best thing is, this is a person in your life who is legally required to keep your secret. If they tell someone else what you tell them, they go to jail, JJ. I was like, yes. (laughs) Now, let me just, let me put you at ease. Your pastor don't got like secrets like that. You know, I'm not frequenting strip clubs. I'm not an addict. I love my wife. You know, I just got one. I don't got another one somewhere. Like, but I do got some secret thoughts that if you were to hear them, you would look for another church. But before you judge me, if we were to hear your secret thoughts <laughs> and, put, and put them on the screen, <laughs> we're like, look over here. <laughs> got some thoughts, man, that if you heard them. So, so he said, yeah, he can't, he can't, he can't, you know, He's got to keep them. I said, okay, well, I'm going to try it out. So we had a session, and in the session, I, I'm going to start them off easy. I said, I'm going to give them, like, the low-level crazy secret thought. And then I said it, and I looked at him, and he had no emotion on his face. I was like, hmm? so I'm going to try something else. So I hit him with the medium crazy secret thought in question. And he's over there. Then I let it all, I went for the high, crazy, secret thought. The thing that if I told you right now, you'd be like, get out of here. Like, I threw that at him, and he heard it. (laughs) So then I just started leaning all out. I asked all the questions, laid out all the doubt, all the fear, all the worry, all the the stuff that I had stopped. And then he said, okay, that's awesome. Uh, Our time is up. (laughs) And he did not give me one piece of advice. Not one, I spent the whole hour venting. He did not give me one piece of advice. I left the room because it was virtual. So I got out of my office. I walked out into the hallway. Liz found me. She said, how was it? I said, awesome. <laughs> it was great. She said, what did he say? And then it was like, it hit me in a moment. Did I just get conned? <laughs> did I just get duped? I realized, like, he didn't say nothing. He didn't say one thing. Anybody's ever been to therapy knows what I'm talking about. He didn't say one thing. He just heard me the whole time. And that was exactly what I needed. I needed a place that I can bring my questions judgment-free because what I had not realized up until that point is that I was judging myself. So whenever I would have a question, immediately following that question would be, how could you think that you're a pastor? How could you doubt like that? Hasn't he been faithful in your life for years? How could you believe that? You grew up in this. You went to Bible school. How could you not know that? How could you not want that? How could you actually desire that when you've got this here and that here? All the doubts came. But when I stepped into a judgment-free zone, I realized that it was out. I was free to keep myself from judgment. I could share it out. Listen to me. Let your questions be the feelings you share and not the shackles you wear. If you keep your questions inside, you will always be bound to your questions. But if you release them, you don't just release them. You release the power they have over you. I think this is why Jesus said, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Not because he was looking for an answer. Because, guys, I've studied Jesus, and he has never asked a question that he didn't know the answer to in advance. Never. You know why he asked God that question? Hear me. Because he knew he was in the presence of someone he could trust. 
He knew he was in a judgment-free zone. He knew that his father would love and accept him no matter the level of his doubt. And so he said, I can give it to you, Lord, freely because I know that you love me and you're listening to me. Judgment-free. The irony and the the reason why he was judgment-free is because Jesus was actually paying the price for judgment as he was praying. So it's, it's, it's the other thing. But... The other reason why God wants your questions here is because God wants to build your faith. And your questions are how he builds faith. I told my wife the other day, I tell her this often. I said, um, babe, thank you. I look in her eyes. I said, babe, thank you for picking me. Thank you for choosing me. It means, it means a lot that you picked me. And then I think she feels obliged to now return the compliment. She looks at me and she goes, no, 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 no. Thank you for choosing me. And then I did what you did. I laughed. Because I'm like, that's cute. But it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. The first time Liz came over my house for a party, I think it was a party for Charlie, came over my house, there was six dudes around the dining room table, and she had one seat right there, six dudes around her. The dining room table set four. Six people all talking, Liz, oh, that's so funny. That's so good. Oh, you went to what school? I'm over there on the side. You know how many people were around me? Zero people. What's <laughs> up, baby? It's not the same. Thank you for choosing me because you chose me although you had options. I didn't have options. I'm the grateful one here. You chose me although you had options. So it makes the value of her choice that much more powerful. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's what you do although you doubt. It's what you do, although it doesn't make sense. It's what you do, although you don't have all the answers. Go ahead and put it on the screen. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's what you do, although, although, although you doubt. You can put it on the screen whenever you want so that they can remember it. And it's very helpful for them to see it. Although you doubt. Are you hearing me? You know why it was so powerful that Jesus said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because right after that, he says this in Luke 23, 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, right after he said that, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. So which is it? Do you trust your father enough to commit your life into his hands? Or do you doubt your father enough to wonder if he's even there? Are you ready for the answer? Both. I trust him, although I wonder if he's even here. I wish you would see faith in these lenses. Faith is having, it's choosing to pray although you wonder if God is listening. Faith is choosing to wait although you wonder if God is working. Faith is choosing to come to church every Sunday although you wonder if you're changing. I didn't know if this is working. I'm still still dealing with what I dealt with last week. I still, I still, I cussed this person out last Sunday. I have a problem. I don't know if I should keep coming, but I'm going to keep coming because faith says you believe it even if you don't see it. Although, 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 it's that although faith. Although, although I feel unqualified, I'm going to step into ministry. Although, although, although. So the question that I want to ask you today really is the question I'd love to answer with you today. And that's what we're going to do in this series. We're going to approach very common and popular questions. Like, I don't know when, but in one of the sermons, we'll, have, we'll answer the question, who am I? We'll deal with insecurity, we'll deal with calling, we'll deal with purpose. I'm excited about that one. But today, I want to answer a very common question in the 11 minutes that I have left. Cool, 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 yeah, yeah. If you got to go, you could go. Um, the question I'm going to answer, hear me, I want to answer the question, Why? Have you ever asked God why? Have you ever looked at the world and asked God why? Why, God, are children born sick? Why do good people die young? Why does the color of my skin determine the quality of my opportunities? Have you ever looked at the Bible and asked why? Why does the Bible say something if sinful, if to me it feels natural? Why would a loving God create in eternal hell? Have you ever looked at your life and asked why? Why, God, would my parents divorce at such a young age? Why would you have allowed that person to 
to take advantage of my body when I was so young? Why am I still struggling with this even though it's been years? Why? Why would that person I love have to die? Why? Well, in the remainder of the sermon, hear me, I'm going to do my best to answer every single one of those questions. I believe I have the answer to your question, why? And I'm confident in it because it's not my answer. It was Jesus' answer when he was asked the same thing. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, this is high-key emotional manipulation. <laughs> the one you love is sick. John 11, 4 through 7 and verse 14. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Amen. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, uh, he dropped everything he was doing and ran to his bedside as fast as he could. Is that not what your Bible says? But, but that's the God that I serve, though. So when, when, he, when he loved Martha, he, he, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he told the disciples, stop what you're doing right now. Put that sandwich down. We need to go take care of my good friend, Lazarus. Is that not what your Bible says? No. That's not what mine says either. I just can't believe what I'm reading. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days? And, and then said to his disciples, Lazarus is dead. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I've got questions. I've got questions. I've got questions. And you know who else got questions? Martha. <laughs> Martha got questions. Do y'all know a Martha? Martha don't play no games. Martha's Puerto Rican. She do not play. Look at verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. I need to, I need to paint the picture because you could read the verse and, and miss the story. He's on his way to Bethany. She leaves Bethany. Meets Jesus on the road to Bethany. So your girl was at home. Somebody said, hey, I heard Jesus is coming that way. And she said, oh, for real? Okay. He got some explaining. He got some explaining to do. Hey, what happened? <laughs> like, this is what happened. She left. As soon as she heard, she said, oh, for real? Okay. I need, I need to talk to him because we got to talk about what happened here. Mary, on the other hand, the Bible says she didn't go. She stayed at home. Oh, this is good, guys, because you got to catch it. Mary and Martha are two sisters who share the same house. But oftentimes, whenever we read about Mary and Martha in the Bible, what we really come to realize is that they are a metaphor for the two parts of our heart. Wow. There's a part of our heart that when God disappoints us, I got questions. Yeah. What, what happened? Why didn't you do what your word said? We'll go to the chapter and the verse. You said you were going to heal him. You said that if I put my trust in you, you said that if I give, I would receive pressed down, shaking, shaking and running over. But then there's another part of us, a Mary, that is so disappointed in God, you don't even want to see him. And both live inside of you. Why? Because God is never afraid of our questions. But sometimes we're afraid of his answers. I remember with my girlfriend before, before Pastor Liz, I never even asked the Lord if she was the one. You know what I prayed? I said, Lord, if she's not the one, make her the one. That was my only prayer. So people, people, people wonder why God don't answer questions prayers sometimes because your prayers are crazy <laughs> if he gave you everything you prayed for you'd be in trouble I was afraid of his answer I didn't even want to ask the question Mary was afraid of the answer but in a different way because one thing we know about Mary is that Mary was relational she was a relational people you know you have a lot of types of people but one category that you can split people in are people who are 
like work oriented and people who are like relational oriented. We know this because they had a party one time and at the end of the party, um, Mary's hanging out with Jesus and Martha's got dishes to do. And so she comes over to Jesus. And she's like, excuse me, Jesus, I'm glad that y'all having a good time. But can you tell my sister to help wash the dishes and throw out the trash? Because she's just sitting here by your feet like she don't live here and she does. So you need to get her to come do it. And, and, and that was just, that was Martha. Martha was, you know, got to get it done. Then we can hang out after, you know, but we got to get this done. I'm more of a Martha myself. And Liz helps me because she balances me out. She's more relational. I'm more get it done. Um, but Mary, she was relational. Mary's that person who stays on the patio at the end of the party just talking for hours, you know, and people, people got to go home and we got to keep this house clean. So she saw everything relationally. So because she saw everything relationally, she saw the disappointment in God not answering her prayer from a relational lens. Wow. When God didn't do what he said he would do, she asked, what is wrong with our relationship that you would not do what you said you would do in my life? Have you ever been disappointed by God and then Ask yourself either one or two questions. What did I do wrong? Yeah, that's right. It's so good. What did I do wrong? I remember when you were pregnant with Vicky and they said that she was going to come out. I was talking to my mom. If this is online, I'm talking to my mom. Vicky's my sister. Context. <laughs> and then the doctor told you that she was going to be born with Down syndrome. She was going to be born with one leg. Medicine was not advanced at that moment. They were off on all those accounts. Um, and then she went to church and they would tell her at church. They said, the reason why you're going through that is because you must have some secret sin in your life. That's what they told her at church. There must be something wrong with you. But you know what? As shocking as that is, when things don't pan out in our life, we ask that about ourselves. Yeah. God, what's up with our relationship? I thought we were close. I thought we were tight. I thought you loved me. Or, or and this is where it gets real scary, maybe I did something wrong. Or maybe you're not as good as they say you are. So we're afraid of the, we're afraid of the answers because we're afraid that the answer will either reveal something about us we're ashamed of or God that we can't digest. So we avoid the question altogether. Martha, though, Martha's a worker. Martha doesn't approach the question relationally. Martha approaches the question product, from a productivity standpoint. Because Martha is a worker. She knows that sometimes you have to sacrifice relationship to get the good product out. So Martha's back there thinking, you know what? You did something that was not good for our relationship. Like, you're not my favorite person right now. But because I understand how work works, I'm going to assume that the reason why you did this was because you were working on something. So I got questions why, but it's a different kind of why than Mary's why. Mary's why is, why don't you love me? Martha's why is, what are you working on? Tell me what you're working on. Because I believe that you're good. I just can't understand why it's happening. It's like, you know, we have a great example. The way I treated my son and the way I treated my dad. I came home from the gym the other day and I can't share this, like, don't tell him this story. Well, I'm just going to tell you his name. One of my sons. I come home, I look, there's an apple and in the apple tray and the apple's got two big black spots on it. I don't even notice it. I see it, I don't think twice about it. I also see that the candle, very expensive candle that my wife got is, is extinguished. It was lit before we left. And not only is it extinguished, it's also damaged. So I don't know what happened. I'm just home. <laughs> Typical dad, right? Just like, <laughs> something happened. I don't care. <laughs> now my wife, my wife's very observant. She looked at the apple. She took it over the candle. She like detective powers came out. Who took the apple and put off the candle with the apple? <laughs> she figured it out like that. Like you're a detective, wizard, witchcraft. How did you, how did you figure that out? She, and then after 10 minutes of lying, one of the boys, and I won't tell you who, ends up saying, okay, okay, it was me, I did it. After he admitted to doing it, I had questions. <laughs> My main question was, why? <laughs> did you not like the apple? <laughs> did you not like the candle? <laughs> why would you do such a thing? And then when he started to explain, I got mad. Because I'm like, I don't think you understand the purpose of this question. <laughs> there is not a world in which whatever it is you are about to say is a good reason to burn produce <laughs> in my house. So he started, well, I said, why? He said, well, what happened was, I said, don't you, I don't care why. <laughs> you better do that. I can't believe you did that. Go back to your room right now. You're burning stuff. Get out of here. 
It's like, how many parents can relate? Sometimes we ask our kids why, and we don't even really want an answer. It's not about the answer. It's about expressing our displeasure and frustration and anger and let them answer that question. Don't you answer it? It wasn't a question to be answered. This question is not about you. It's about me. Don't treat God like that. Sometimes God will disappoint us in life and we'll ask him why. And before he can even begin to send his Holy Spirit to minister to our spirit, we'll go, no, 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 no. You let me down. You weren't supposed to do that. I don't see how this could possibly be good. I don't even care about your answer. You messed up. Don't treat God like the kid who lives in your house. He don't deserve, he don't owe you answers. You live in his house. Like, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, listen to me, my dad, my dad came over. I had him come over a month ago because my doorbell wasn't working. So I said, dad, can you fix my doorbell? He said, yeah. I said, this is the doorbell. This is the chime. I know enough to know that the doorbell makes the chime go off. So I hit this button and the ding dong happens there. So I said, these two things aren't working. I said, um, can you fix it? He goes, yeah. He came over. He looked at it. He went into the garage and he put a hole in the wall that is not even adjacent to the chime. <laughs> it's a whole nother wall. Rick, you know what he was doing? Because you, yeah, because you do work at the, it's a whole thing. I don't know what it's called. A transistor, a transformer, Optimus Prime, I don't know. It was over there in the corner. He, he, he puts a hole in the wall that wasn't even connected to the chime. I'm like, bro, I got questions. What did this wall ever do to you? This wall is not even, this wall got nothing to do with that. Why? But it was a different kind of why. It wasn't the kind of why that I asked my kid. It's the kind of why that I gave knowing, I don't know, but I know that you know. So, so I trust that you've been doing this long enough. I trust that you've been God long enough that if you put a hole in one area of my life that, that, that I don't agree with, that I've got questions about, that if you start taking stuff down that I get mad about, I gotta trust that you know what you're doing even when I don't know what you're doing. So hey, I ain't mad, I just got questions. I just wanna know, I, I believe you're good. Now help me understand how this plays into your goodness. I believe you got a plan. Now just help me understand how this plays into your plan. That's a good question to ask the Lord. Either you presume his disinterest and hatred for you, or you presume his goodness and his sovereignty. But whichever one you presume, is, is how you, that's how you pray. That's how you come. So, so ask those kinds of whys. And that's what Martha did. That's what Martha did. Look what she says in the next verse. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Look what she said in 22. But I know that even now God will give you what you ask. I know you can do it. I know you got a plan. I know you're working it out. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I know you're working something out because you're a worker. I'm a worker. I know how this is. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. But Martha really didn't believe that it would happen in that moment. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha's got a why question because she knows that Jesus can do it, could have done it, and didn't do it. And now when the why comes out, when we know he can do it, Huh? And he chose not to do it. And we go, hold up, but I know you can. So why didn't you? Oof. This is Jesus' answer. Here it is. Here it is. I told you I would do my best to answer your question. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Are you ready? Whatever your why question is. God's answer to the question, why, is I am. I am. I appreciate you clapping, but some of you have no idea why you're clapping. <laughs> Seems like the right time. Or maybe you got it. Maybe the Holy Spirit illuminated you and you caught it before I could even preach it. Because it seems like he didn't give the answer. And, and on the one hand, he didn't give the answer, and that's messed up, Jesus. I really could appreciate it. I could use an answer. But on the other hand, he gave the answer. 
It is, uh, he didn't give it, but he gave it. How can you reconcile both of those? I think Jesus would tell you this if you are mad at him for not giving you the answer, even though he gave you the answer. I think he would say, you wouldn't understand the answer, even if I gave it to you, because I am on a different level. Do you know that God operates on a whole different level than you and me? Like a whole nother level. Like I was hanging out with Jason the other day. I wanted him to do something in our services and it was a technical thing. And Jason's a genius. He's our programming director. He knows broadcasting, he knows worship, he knows creative, he knows lights, he knows electrical stuff. He's real smart. He said, we can't do it. I said, why? He said, well, let me explain. Then he explained for five minutes. At the end of his five minutes, he says, it makes sense? I said, no. I asked him, I said, can you use different words and explain the same thing to me? He goes, yeah, I'll try, I'll try. So he used all different words. He didn't repeat one word, all different words. He said, do you get it now? I said, no. I said, try different -er words than the last different words that you tried. I really wanna get this. Try explain it one more time. He explained it one more time. He said, okay, what do you think? Do you get it now? I said, no, but it's not your fault. <laughs> you are doing the best that you can. It's my fault. I don't understand what you understand. I don't have the knowledge or the insight that you have. I can't understand things that only you understand. But you know what? You explained it three times, so I'm pretty sure you understand. <laughs> so it's okay because even though I don't understand, I understand that you understand. And if you understand, then you go ahead and do what you got to do because you understand. Do you understand? When God makes a decision, it's not just a decision that affects you. It's a decision that affects your children and their children and their children. And God has got the entire timeline of eternity teed up. So, so he can't even begin to explain to you that the reason why the relationship had to end was because 30 years down the line, it would have an impact that would affect your great grandkids. So if he actually set you down and tried to tell your brain would dissolve. <laughs> I have a little joke. I say, trying to understand, God trying to explain his plans to you is like you trying to explain algebra to your goldfish. Different levels. Where would you even begin? God is on such a higher level than us. So we got to understand. So he goes, he goes, listen, you wouldn't understand it if I explained it. I am on another level. When he says I am, this is a tough one, but you got to eat this, swallow this. This is good. It hurts, but it's good. He goes, listen, I know you want an answer and I know you don't like my answer. He's what he would tell you, but you're not the one who gets to decide the answer. I am. I am. Isn't it funny? You know, we only have questions about the things we disagree with. You know what my son has never said after I told him we're going to Disney World? Why? Never. He's like, let's go. You know what my son has never said after I offered him ice cream for dinner? You want to have ice cream for dinner? He's never, ever said, why? But you know when he says why? Hey, buddy, time to go to bed. Why? Hey, buddy, time to brush your teeth. Why? Hey, man, time to clean up your room. Why? Because we only question the things we disagree with. Wow, that's so, big. so when God doesn't do it the way you would want him to do it, we ask, why? But the thing that I have to remind my son about is, buddy, you don't get to decide right now. Daddy's the one who's in charge. It just blows my mind that we would say that we believe in God, but then get mad when he acts like a God. Do we all, are we all on the same page about what a God is? God means he sets the rules. God means he says what's right and wrong. God means he says go. He says where. He says when. You can't just have him as your savior and not sign up for him as your Lord. He's not in this to be 50-50. He's Lord and Savior, yeah. Jesus Christ. So when he makes a decision that you don't agree with, it's just a reminder that he's God and you're not. I asked Pastor Jenny for permission to share this because her daughter, Eloise, 
Um, Pastor Jenny has four girls, the boss girls, and their name is exactly who they are. Them girls are strong, amazing women. I, uh, I don't want to share too much of their testimony because that, that'll be their story for another day. Pastor Jenny's, she shared it very openly, but to give you just some basic context, Pastor Jenny's girls have pretty much grown up without a father. And uh, when their father was no longer around, Eloise, the eight-year-old, I remember you sharing this with me, that she was probably the one who took it the hardest. Now, you already know kids got questions. So imagine an eight-year-old growing up with no dad. She got questions. You know how she decided she would process it? An eight-year-old? She wrote a song. And I want to share with you some of the lyrics, because when Pastor Jenny shared it with me, I'm like, this is going to go on the album. And, uh, and I just want to share it with you. The song is called, she's eight. The song is called Names for You. Names for You. For God. This is the opener. This is the opening line of the song. The name of the story is you. I don't know if I'm looking too deep into it for the heart of an eight-year-old, but I think what she's saying is, it's your script. She's eight. Because the, the, the story is you, Jesus. I'm just a, a, a part of your story. Oh my gosh. Her theology is on point, Pastor Hector. It's a story about Jesus, isn't it? The name of the story is you. Look what she says. Because you are the Savior and you are the King. You know a way to save me. Hold on, the banger is not even there. Wait till you hear this line. You know a way to save me. There is a way for you to save me. And whenever I'm afraid, I know you're there to save me. Because you make a better king than me. This is an eight-year-old who would do anything to have her father back in her life. It has the faith to say, but you know what? You make a better king than me. Got chills. Because I've tried to be my own king. Anybody there with me? I tried to be the God of my own life. I tried to make my own decisions. I tried to date the people I wanted to date. I, I tried to have the job that that, and I tried, and every time I tried to be my own king, I ended up on the side of the road, empty, broken, brokenhearted, depressed. I've gotten to the point. Is there anybody who, you make a better king than me. I give the, th the crown to you. I step off the throne, sit on the throne of my life and my heart, Lord. You make a better king than me. I don't want to be in charge. You be in charge. And then her song ends off with, because Jesus, you are bootyful. She wrote booty. Bootyful. Jesus, you are bootyful. He is. And here's the last thing I think Jesus would tell you if you got a wide question. You wouldn't understand the answer because I am on another level. You don't get to decide the answer. I am, and, he, and I think he answered I am because this is the last thing I want you to go home with. You're looking for an answer? Cool. Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. Because, 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 what you've been really looking for wasn't an answer. You were looking for hope. And Jesus says, I am hope. You weren't really looking for an answer. You were looking for closure. So Jesus says, I am closure. You weren't really looking for an answer. You were looking for peace. I'm the prince of peace. I, what you think you're looking for it's not what you are really looking for. And if I did not deposit, if I did not allow you to question, <laughs> you would have never arrived at the answer. So I had to, are you tracking me? I had to put you on a path of questions. Process of elimination. Remember the multiple choice? That don't work. That don't work. That don't work. That don't work. Yeah. It's got to be that one. When you spend your whole life trying to do it on your own. That don't work. That don't work. That don't work. That don't work. It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be Jesus. He's the only one who can set me free. He's the only one who can mend my heart. He's the only one who can heal me. He's the only one who can make me well. He's the only one who can bless me. He's the only one who can fill me. It's got to be 
Jesus. I tried money. It didn't work. I tried sex. It didn't work. I tried popularity. It didn't work. It's got to be Jesus. Jesus has got to be the answer of my life. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. Stay standing, stay standing. The answer's got to be Jesus. That's why none of it worked up until right now. And then when you get in his presence, I'm closing right now. Then when you get in his presence, look what happens. Remember that song? Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. Look at Psalm 73. Remember Asaph, the worship director, who about lost his stuff? Talking about, God, where are you? Why don't you love me? Look what he says in verse 16 at the end of his prayer. When I tried to understand all my questions, it troubled me deeply. Until I entered into the sanctuary of God. Then when I got in God's presence, I realized, this is what I've been missing all along. This is the one. It's got to be Jesus. I promise you, bring your questions to the feet of Jesus. You might not leave with an answer. There's no way you don't leave without the answer. I need somebody to say amen if you know what I'm preaching about. You get into God's presence because you're wrestling with some things. And then, and you're expecting like addresses and dates and names and numbers and, and, and God's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're like, yeah, Lord. And he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're like, all right, well, what do you got to say about that? And he's like, I am. And his presence wraps you in his arms. I am. But God, I don't understand why you could, I know. Have you lived it? Then let me remind you of it. His answer is I am. It's I am. Every hand by the eye closed. If you're in this room today, if you're in this room today and you didn't know the answer was Jesus, like you don't have a relationship with him, you're far from him. When I say three, I want you to raise your right hand high to the sky as a signal. Jesus, I need you in my life. I've been trying other things and it hasn't been working. It's gotta be you. It's gotta be you. It's gotta be Jesus. You're the answer. All over this room, if that's you, and you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, on three, raise your right hand high. One, two, three, raise your right hand high to the sky. You need Jesus, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. Amen, amen. So many hands. Go ahead and put your hand down, put your hand down. Let me lead you in this prayer, whether you raised your hand or not, Journey Church. Let's not leave those who did hanging. Say out loud, Father God, I've got questions, but today I choose to believe. Although I have questions, I believe you're the answer. Jesus, be the Savior and Lord of my life. I surrender to you. I love you, Jesus. Forgive me for my choices. Today I choose you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for watching. Don't let the journey stop here. We'd love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry blessed you at all, subscribe so that you can find out when the next video comes out. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to support us financially, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for your time. God bless.